So thank you very much, and it's fa been fabulous so far, lots and lots of information uh, so far. Well done the organisers, and it's lovely to see so many of you, but also to see so many old friends here, and uh, colleagues uh, from uh, blasts from the past sometimes, uh, that, and even people at CAMH who I haven't seen for so long. Uh, either they've been hiding from me, or I've been hiding from them, not sure which one way around. But I'm pretty sure with all of this commitment, all the brain power in here, that uh, we're going to have a more equitable uh, Toronto in the future, and especially with some of the exciting things that are going forward. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and tell you three stories. And uh, one's from the UK, one's some reflections about what we've been trying to do at CAMH. And one is some data that we've got from Toronto, and the story's unfinished, and so we'll see whether in the question period we'll get to finish that story about what to do. Um, they're all about the journey from bench to bedside, and this idea of bench to bedside is you get this data, and they usually think of lab rat type data, and you move it all the way from there to the bedside to actual change. And so this is a metaphor for taking uh, diversity, ethnicity, or equality data and moving that from just being data on the page uh, to actually making some change and the things you sort of need to do to make that happen. So it's more about strategy than implementation. But I am respectful of the fact that I am the guy between you and your lunch. They laughed nervously. <laughs> I was right. Uh, and so I'll keep it relatively light, I'll keep it at the story level. Uh, and for those of you who've had a lot of information so far and you want key messages, I'm going to give you three uh, messages uh, which sort of sum up my talk, but uh, they're done in the form of sayings or jokes. And they're from the 80s, so if you've heard them before, you can groan, okay? Uh, I, usually, you know, if you want people to laugh or clap or whatever, you, 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 you get them to practice. But the idea of getting you to practice groaning at my jokes, I think, isn't going to work very well. So, first message is a simple message, and you've heard this one surely. And if you have heard this, you can shout it out. So, remember these are from the 80s. How many psychiatrists does it take to fix a light bulb? One, but it's got to want to change. Fabulous. Okay. First message. If you, if you really want to move forward with your services and health equity, they have to want to change. Yeah. One, but it's got to have to want to change. This is one thing uh, that they've been teaching me with the work that I've been doing in Kenya. And they've got an old saying, which is, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Fabulous. So we've got two messages. First message is that, um, uh, you know, the light bulb's got to want to change. The other one is how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And the third story is a story that uh, one of my friends told me about a holiday he had in France. And he was driving late at night to this little bed and breakfast in rural France and as he drove up somebody else drove up at the same time and that person rushed in in front of him stood in front of him and went to the counter and said have you got a room and uh, the woman there sort of went she's like no 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 have you got a, a room a room He said, no, no, no. Have you got a, a room? A room? A room? A room? So, no, 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 no. So he went away. And my friend came up behind and said in his uh, sort of year 10 uh, French, which is about as far as we get in, in the UK, uh, Avez-vous une chambre, s'il vous plaît? And she said, but of course. <laughs> he said, thank you, and of course he, he got the room first and then said to her, but why didn't you give a room to that other person? He said, 
And he didn't speak French. And he didn't even try. He didn't ex speak French and he didn't even try. The third message is, when in France, speak French. <laughs> Everybody knows that. The number of people I've seen turn up to senior leadership team in uh, CAMH or wherever and speak as researchers or speak as advocates or speak as health equity people and not speak the language of the management of organization. It's mind boggling because you see it happening and people start speaking and the lights turn off. When in France, speak French. Okay, so the talk, bench to bedside. As I said, two examples. Uh, one in the UK, one some reflections from CAMH, and one some unfinished data. I told you it was from the 70s, <laughs> 80s, sorry. Uh, and this is where the, the journey starts, in the 80s, in the 80s. Does anybody remember those things? They are nearly mobile phones. <laughs> yeah. The only th good thing about them is you could get your, and we've got a cardiologist here, you could get your cardio in at the same time as carrying your phone and all of your all of your conversations are really short because after two minutes you're saying oh, my, my arm is getting a bit tired now <laughs> you know. but uh, there you are the nearly mobile phone uh, that you've got there in the uk data collection uh, socioeconomic data collection ethnicity data collection started in about 1981 that's when people started thinking about it in 1991, people started doing it after the census, and um, that's when we started getting lots of data uh, at a, uh, you know, just a, at a normal level for just about every health service in the uh, UK. Some difficulties in primary care, the primary care physician didn't want to collect them, but everywhere else, you got data. So there's lots of data around. Now, the data was very clear. In the UK, the data Though it looked like ethnicity data, it was based on race. All of the, all of the categories collapsed down into black, brown, white, basically. And the aim was to make sure that there was race equality in access to services uh, and then eventually in outcomes of services. So that's what people wanted to do. So there was lots of data around. Um, on the psychiatry side, that data was pretty clear, that data was frightening. Um, if you are African or Caribbean, you're about four to six times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, if you had schizophrenia, you were 30% more, more likely to get injections. You were two times less whether you had schizophrenia or depression or anxiety to get psychotherapy, so you weren't going to get psychotherapy. Uh, you are twice as likely to have police involvement in taking you to uh, services. The admissions were longer, about 30%. 30% uh, less community follow-up uh, for black and minority ethnic groups. But the interesting thing, and this is where speaking French uh, sort of worked uh, for, the, um, um, uh, for the hierarchy in NHS, is it was 36% more expensive. So for every person who was African or Caribbean particularly, when uh, the NHS was paying 36% more on their mental health than uh, the average person who was white. And that was because people weren't getting community care, people weren't getting psychotherapy, and people were having long admissions in hospital because they didn't like the system, they were fighting the system, or they came through being pulled in by the uh, prison system. So they believed that if you produced equitable services, you'd actually cut costs. Yeah. So you'd think that was a good reason for doing things, yeah? You still with me? Anyone out there? Yeah, okay, good. You'd think that was a good reason for doing things. That didn't make any difference. <coughs> it made difference to small services, so I set up a service with others uh, called Antenna, which was uh, specifically for black and minority ethnic groups. In the University College London, there was a psych psychotherapy group uh, for diverse populations. There was a centre for health improvement, which looked at equity, and there was some work on suicide prevention. But only small things, uh, nothing significant. 
what it actually took to uh, get the data moving uh, was two tragic events. On the left, there's a picture of Stephen Lawrence. Stephen Lawrence was a young man who was standing by himself, uh, 16 or 17, he was standing by himself at a bus shelter and he was attacked by a, couple of, uh, by a group of racist thugs and killed. Uh, the police um, did an inquiry. The inquiry didn't manage to uh, put anybody in prison, though everybody knew who was doing who, who had actually done it. And uh, the family pushed and pushed and pushed for another inquiry and another inquiry, and eventually uh, an old uh, judge called McPherson was asked to do a public inquiry, and when he did his public inquiry, he came up with uh, the comment that he couldn't find any one person in the Metropolitan Police who had deliberately discriminated against Stephen Lawrence. But he was sure that all of the small actions that they had done together had led to institutional racism. And he said that the Metropolitan Police were institutionally racist and something had to be done. The government had decided that they were going to take, uh, they'd said up front that they would take whatever came out of the McPherson inquiry and turn it into law. And so this law became something called the Race Relations Amendment Act. And for public services, this gave public services three uh, responsibilities. One, they had to promote race relations. Fancy that. And at a public service, so your hospital, or your CHC, uh, or the Toronto Central Lynn, uh, which actually does a good job, but the, you would have to, he, he says, looking at Camille right in front of him, um, uh, respecting the power and authority, um, uh, that um, uh, you would have to promote race equality. So that's what one of the things they had to do. The other thing is they had to provide equitable treatment. And the third thing they had to do was measure it. And so this was the law. And uh, this law, in theory, would have made a difference, yeah? Okay, you've got the data, you've got the law, people are going to change. Now you've gone quiet because you know there's a law of three. So, you know, the first one doesn't work, the second one doesn't work. So it's always the third one that works, yeah? Maybe, perhaps. <laughs> so in mental health services, everybody talked about change. Everybody wanted to change. Uh, psychiatrists did actually want to change, but they didn't know how. And what happened was there was a death in psychiatric services of uh, a young uh, black man. The, the story was uh, that he had been racially abused. And when he had been racially abused, he had tried to attack one of his co-patients. Uh, the staff had broke, take, broken them up and they had moved him to another ward. When he was brought back to collect his things, he realized that he had been moved, but the other person hadn't been moved. And he got very, very angry, and uh, you know, got angry with staff. The staff called uh, security, and they sat on him, and when they sat on him, he died. Okay. And this was another inquiry. And nobody wanted to do an inquiry. People said, well, you know, this is just an extreme circumstance. We don't need an inquiry. Uh, but the relative of Rocky Bennett, uh, who's now uh, head of nursing at the University of the West Indies in Kingston, uh, was, uh, had just finished her degree and wanted to do something about her brother's death. And she went to do a master's, she took a PhD, and then she just fought and fought and fought for a public inquiry. And the public inquiry um, found all the data that there had been about disparities in the National Health Service. The data that had been collected over years, the data that people hadn't done anything with, but had been diligently collected, and that data was the basis of um, some work uh, that uh, was called Delivering Race Equality. 
because the Deputy Prime Minister in the UK had seen the data and said this was scandalous and that enough was enough, no more talk, let's do something. Let's actually make a change, let's move things forward. Um, actually, John Prescott, um, who was the Deputy Mine Prime Minister at the time, as far as I can work out, did almost nothing when he was in government, apart from he got really interested in social exclusion. And his social exclusion unit really made a difference in the UK and then moved out into Europe. And so you'll see social exclusion Europe's all around European cities, which are based on, on the work of uh, John Prescott, who otherwise people would have forgotten as a politician. So the action plan that came from this data was called Delivering Race Equality. Um, and um, my job when I was working with the Department of Health uh, uh, and with the government was to write this and then push it through. And we tried to keep it really simple because it can get really highfalutin and, and really complex, but the basis is very, very simple to most things that move forward. We wanted appropriate and sensitive services, we wanted community engagement, and we wanted all of that data that had been collected to be used uh, properly going forward. Um, so the sensitive and responsive, responsive services, we didn't want, um, this is back to one byte at a time, we thought we couldn't do it across the whole of the National Health Service. You probably won't know that um, at this time, back in, this was in the 90s, there was only one uh, employer that was bigger than the National Health Service in the whole of Europe. Uh, and that was uh, the Red Army. So uh, the, the Russian Army was the only employer that was bigger than the National Health Service at that time. So you can imagine how difficult it would be to move forward uh, in, at that time. And so we thought we wouldn't try and do everybody, we'd do it a bite at a time. We'd look at the most ready organisations uh, in the NHS and we'd get them moving. And we called them fo focused implementation sites. Um, because at the time, you know, we, we thought fizz sounded good. It sounds really lame now, but we were young. Um, <laughs> it sounded like it was sort of fizz, they're going to whiz, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. <sighs> Those were the days. Um, so we called them focused implementation sites and we uh, basically dumped a huge amount of time and support and resources into them. There was some new money, but not a lot of new money because we did what Dr. Braveman was saying about this idea of equity and social justice. We said, you've got the money, now you've got to use it properly. We're not giving you lots of new money to do add-ons. You've got to decide how you're going to change allocation of your own resources to make this work for everybody. And so that was the social justice aim. Um, we said that people had to have race equality plans and then we included uh, race and ethnicity into the National Suicide Prevention Strategy. For community engagement, uh, we, had, we got money for 500 community development workers, which was new money. And for data monitoring, uh, we wanted to improve service and outcomes. And so what we wanted to do, all of this stuff had been based on uh, data, but when you actually looked at the data, the data was good, but not that good. 60 to 70% data completion we were getting across the NHS. And this was partly, that was enough to get things going, but that was never gonna be enough to monitor outcomes in any sensible way. So there's three deliverables were improved access, improved experience, and improved outcome. And our Minister of Health was very, very clear that um, not only did we have to do it, um, but um, there were people were going to be called to account. So we had to do it and we had to measure outcomes. So this is something that um, uh, we then tried to do, um, which, which worked pretty well, and I'll just tell you how it worked. Uh, we decided that one way of doing this was having a national census of all NHS hospitals that happened on one day a year uh, and we looked at all psychiatric patients and we collect sociodemographic data and also clinical outcome data at the same time. 
and it was called the Count Me In Census. And it was based on that idea that if you do not count people, they don't count. Simple as that. You know, I mean, that's what dem democracies count stuff, yeah? So, you know, when in France speak French, democracies count stuff, count stuff. If you count stuff, uh, you can uh, sometimes lead to some change. So we have this national census, 31st of uh, March each year, buying from senior management. The actual uh, data was input, not by new people, not by new staff, actually by uh, people on the ward. We worked out how many people each person would have to put data in for, it was about 10 uh, on that day. And we got a very simple training video, maybe a bit like the Ally videos. And if there were trouble, we could do some face-to-face -face work, but generally we didn't do face-to-face -face work. But what we did for hospitals is we said each hospital and each NHS unit and each NHS district would have a part of their website which was their own data. So we had aggregate data for the whole country, but for individual parts of the NHS, they could see their own data. They could see their data conclusion, uh, completion, they could see their disparities, but they got given this data for themselves. But they knew we could see it. And that was the thing that made a difference. They had their own data, no one else in the NHS could see it, but we could. So we could see their disparities and we could measure it year on year. So this was gonna be a yearly thing. And then uh, part of the community engagement was to produce a yearly report. So each year there was a report, mental health, disparities, outcomes by race, socioeconomic group in the, uh, that went into the news. Uh, and it did make news every year. And that was another lever to produce change. The big change that it produced, apart from people thinking creatively about service development, was that that standard data collection, which was going at 60 or 70 percent, moved up to 95 percent. So over that five years, this new way of data collection, uh, which by the way produced about 97 percent completion. 85% um, of people uh, did their own sort of, uh, sort of self-assessed ethnicity in the social demographic group. About 15% of people needed some help, but 97% of NHS hospitals uh, with over 90% completion of the data. So it was a really good data set. But their side uh, impacts were that this um, um, uh, sort of standard data collection on uh, you know, cancer screening, on everything that in, was in the NHS, went up from 60, 70% to 95%. So after five years, there was actually no need for the Count Me In Census. There was no need for that cross-sectional uh, census, but it pushed things forward. And what we learned for it was data's important, but Dr. Braben was saying that data's important, but it not always sufficient to produce change. Data in context can help and lead to change, and it can uh, lead to monitoring, it can be useful for monitoring. The national census was cheap, by the way, and very easy to do. We didn't need huge amounts of training. People knew how to do it, and maybe because it's psychiatry, but people are used to asking a lot of these questions. Um, if you can make it an organisational priority, people will do it. Uh, and there are side effects of just increasing the amount of equity data collection in general. So that's what we learned. Um, when the NHS wanted to change, this is this um, psychiatrist and light bulb, they changed. When we were speaking about things that they understood and it became sort of more legal, uh, and they understood what needed to happen, they could understand what we wanted. And uh, when we tried to do things bit by bit, it generally worked. So, fast forward. Uh, back in the uh, 80s, when this all started, uh, I was coming out of my Jackson 5 phase. Uh, and what's funny about that? 
Uh, it was a time when I could actually have been called an Afro-Caribbean. Uh, I don't know that I could be called an Afro-Caribbean at the moment. I don't have an Afro. In the 90s, I went through uh, my Grace Jones phase. Did, did everybody have a Grace Jones phase? The square haircut, yeah, and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, back to those of the days. Um, but then by the time I'd come to Cam H, no hair. <laughs> so now we're in the health equity at Cam H and no hair phase. And the interesting thing for health equity at Cam H was you've heard earlier about some of the work that's been done in Aboriginal services. Uh, you've heard we've been doing things with rainbow services and addictions, probably. You've heard about SAPACY, which is addictions and concurrent disorders for African Caribbeans. They were these boutique services that were happening. Uh, and you've heard later that that sort of grown. So the, at uh, PSSP, and you heard this morning, they're thinking much more fundamentally about an urban Aboriginal uh, 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 strategy as well as strategy in the Northern Territories uh, of Ontario. But really, when I got there, Cam H, um, there wasn't a huge amount of new clinical change happening in uh, what was then the diversity office. There wasn't a lot going on. There was a lot of rhetoric, but there wasn't a lot going on. And the issue was interesting. So when we changed, we eventually changed from having a diversity office to a health equity office, and this is part of speaking French in France. Everybody else is moving to health equity. Sitting in diversity doesn't necessarily work very well for service change. Um, but when we started the health equity office, um, we realised that there was an interesting uh, situation that we'd have to deal with. Camage at that time was 3,200 people. The health equity office was six, five, five, three and a half thousand, five. Difficult issue. How do five people manage to change 3,200 people? And that was the issue. So the first thing we wanted to do, and this is obviously going to be a one bite at a time idea, is that we um, started off by just doing an exploratory scan. What was happening in CAMH? What's the culture? What works in CAMH? What else has worked in CAMH? How did it work? And we started to think strategically rather than jumping in with two feet. There were a few things that were clear, and they're clear of a lot of organisations, just not CAMH, is that senior staff approval is needed to move things forward, otherwise it gets stopped. But then there's outside leverage that is needed to move things forward. In CAMH specifically, evidence-based approaches uh, are important, so people like the idea of evidence. Uh, they also, we talk about transforming things, but really CAMH works through incremental change, usually. Uh, and staff are hard worked. If you just give them more things to do, they generally say yes, they generally don't do it. <laughs> okay? That's what happens. And that's not because they don't want to do it. That's because there are so many other things that they are supposed to do that they can't get round to. So we started off by trying to get equity into it by explaining that equity was mainstream, and this is uh, to the senior management. We started off by pulling in the outside levers of the French Language Services Act, the Local Health Systems Integration Act, the Canada Health Act, and the Excellent Care for All Act, all of which are uh, levers in equity, all of which mention equity, all of which talk about equity, and all of which are the framework uh, in which hospitals work, all of which all the hospitals had already signed up to. So they all agreed to that. So we weren't telling them about equity anew. We were reminding them that this was something that they wanted to do and we would try and help them. And that's the position we took. We started off at the top and um, we got the new CEO in. So of course we trained the CEO and the senior management team on things that were considered important to the system, health equity impact assessment. And we got the LIN, 
and we also got the ministry in to train everybody. And it was interesting, and one of the things that was interesting with me about the health equity impact assessment is everybody thought that it would be the clinicians and it would be the service leads who would really seize on this idea of health equity impact assessment and move it forward. The people who actually seized upon it were PSSP, so they're our policy and system support group. They seized on it and said, this is important. Yeah, we need to do this when we're thinking about how we're going to look at ourselves in the community. And then it was our money people. Our money people, our COO, our money people were really interested in health equity impact assessment. They said, well, this is great. This is a, this is a tool, this is a strategy, this is a grid that can be filled in and then you can give it to us and we'll know whether we're doing good or bad or what we're doing, whether this proposal is going to work. And so uh, at one time, and we're working, still working with them on that time, the CEO's position, sorry, the COO's position was that no big money proposals could go through his office without the health equity impact assessment. So there's got to be a financial assessment and there's got to be a health equity impact assessment so that they know that they are doing their bit of health equity and that's the sort of, that was a nice move. Um, we went, as I said, went to the top and we uh, tried to get health equity positioned as a strategic goal of the organisation and we were able to do that. And then we, um, our, transform, our transformative work was uh, to change the way we thought about uh, clinical change and system change. We said what we wanted to do was collect data and we wanted that data to identify disparities. Then we wanted to pass it over to the clinical programs and say, how are you going to decrease those disparities? Come up with some ideas and we're gonna be measuring you again in two years. And we'll produ be producing reports in order to help you do that. But there are only five of us we're not responsible for health equity. You're responsible for health equity. You're responsible for equality. You're responsible for quality. Health equity equals quality. You're responsible for quality. We will help you, but it's your responsibility, not ours. We are advisors. We will support you. If you get stuck, we'll help, but we're not doing your work for you because we respect you as clinicians, and there are only five of us. What everybody thought we would try and do when we started off, because we said we'd do about three things a year, is that we would go to maybe socioeconomic marginalisation, maybe ethnicity. So we didn't. We produced a women's strategy. And so our first health equity strategy was a women's strategy. We were able to see that just like every hospital probably in the Lynn, there is already data on the number of women and the number of men who go through each part of the hospital. And at CAMH, we had been reporting disparities due to uh, gender for a decade, but not doing anything about it. So we just asked the question, how come at CAMH only 43% of the people who are seen are women. How come in the emergency department only 44%? Uh, this is, you know how you get old? I can't actually read my slides down there. <laughs> Just one second. <laughs> Can anybody read that? 45, 45 thank you. 45%. Uh, uh, I never thought I'd need a magnifier for my slides. It's, it's, uh, it's happening. How come in addictions we've got uh, changing, because I can't read it, such low rates of, uh, <laughs> of, of women involved. But the thing that really hit us was the only thing that looked like it was 50-50, women to men, was um, looking at mood disorders, depression. 50-50 women to men and depression. And this is where the equity lens came in instead of the equality lens. When we tried to explain to uh, management the difference between equity and equality, uh, we used to say, or I used to say, and you've already put, all been there, how many people have been to the Air Canada Centre? 
Yeah? And when you go to the Air Canada Centre to see anything, there are exactly the same number of toilets for men <laughs> as women. Yeah? There are. There are the same number of toilets for men as women, total equality. And the lines for the women's are three times longer than the lines for the men. Yeah? Yeah? No equity. Okay? So if you were going to try and make the lines the same length, you'd probably have more female toilets than you would male toilets, and then everybody would move through at an equitable rate. And everybody gets that, yeah? Simple. Everybody gets that. Everybody has waited in that queue um, thinking, isn't it sad that the women have to wait so long, then saying, nah. <laughs> yeah. Women have waited in the queue thinking, and it was interesting, recently I was in Venice, and when I was in the, uh, in the loo, they were just, just young women just came in. <laughs> they just said, ah, forget that, you know. That, that, that sign clearly doesn't mean anything for me because it seems to be a sign of somebody with trousers, and I'm wearing trousers, so... <laughs> You know, that's all it means. And so, you know, you would, if from an equity perspective, you'd have more toilets for women. Very simple. From equality, you try and give it exactly, you have exactly the same resources and you wouldn't get the same outcomes. Very simple. Nobody in senior management has any problem with that and they are able to see it. So when you say that, and then you say 50 50 men and women in uh, depression services, they say, great, that's fine, that's equality. And I say, that's fine. The only problem is women are about twice as likely to become depressed as men. That's not equity. And so we're able to push on that as a, an idea of what are we doing about equity. And we've been able slowly, and it has been slow, but sometimes the things that you really need to happen that have ingrained practices are slow to change. But we've got an ongoing um, uh, strategy around uh, delivering um, equity to women at CAMH and that has helped us uh, think of other things. The other leaders, leaders that we had in CAMH is our partners. So we're not the only people uh, who are working on health equity in CAMH and we're working across health at that. But we have a long list of external partners who have helped us to move things forward at CAMH so that the five of us don't seem, um, um, uh, don't seem too isolated. So we had a very straightforward strategy and I wanted just to tell you very quickly because we're supposed to talk about data collection on how to get um, CAMH to collect data on uh, ethnicity. We started off um, by having a strategy which is it was needed in order to look at uh, disparities. We then pushed and said to people, and this is usually something that works reasonably well at CAMH, which is, you know you guys are already doing this. You're already collecting lots of data, and actually, probably about 40% of the things that are in the tri-hospital form, or the LINS form, uh, for um, the sort of socio-demographic data collection, was already being collected at CAMH. So we're able to say, you know, you're actually good at this, you're already doing it, uh, we just want to systematise it. The data wasn't required by the Health Equity Office, the data was required by the hierarchy of CAMH for the strategic plan. But then we used the one bite at a time, incremental approach. Uh, we started off by getting ethnicity data collected in the emergency department. That's because the emergency department at CAMH are really good at collecting data. And it puts us in a position where if they are over 90%, 95% data collection, we can say to other parts of CAMH, well, you know, these guys don't have a problem with collecting this data. And they seem to be able to do it at 95%. We don't understand the problem, you know. You might want to talk to them and find out how they do it, but, you know, you've got to do it. We then moved on, having demonstrated that they could do it and they did do it. Uh, we produced a feedback report to them which showed that actually in the emergency department at CAMH at that time, 
they were seeing people in line with um, the Lin, the Lin's um, sort of uh, uh, demographics, and so they were happy with that. Uh, so that when we started uh, trying to collect the Lin data, um, or use the Lin data tool or try it out, one of the places we were going to go to start off with was always going to be the emergency department. And, and the thing that's and the strategic importance of the emergency department is that of the 25,000 new people who are seen at CAMH each year, uh, 7,000 people are seen in the emergency department first. So if, the, if you can get the emergency department doing it, then you're doing a really good job. You've really bitten into what's needed at CAMH. And they do do it, and they've, they've been doing it really well. And then we've started rolling out to all clinical services uh, with the tool over the 2013-2014. Over Initially, it was going to be a lot slower, but in the end, what's happened, we were really happy that Lynn said that we needed to have a report done by the end of, um, by the end of uh, March 2014. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> so this is a group effort. Uh, anybody who wants to chime in, please. Um, so by the end of March 2014, so that we could speed up uh, comprehensive data collection at CAMH. Um, so we did it very low key. We had a very short video based uh, tuition. It was a very straightforward, the, the basic message at the back of it was this isn't a big thing, you can do it. Yeah. Because one of the things that always happens when you're trying to do new things is that people get very anxious and we wanted to decrease the level of anxiety to make sure that it happened. We started with the ADT officers because they always get things done. Um, we had some online training, but then some face-to-face -face backup if, uh, needed, if we needed to. And when we got pushback, we usually found that people were trying to pull us into the weeds, and the aim was to push it to another level so that we weren't talking about what, because we thought that they were bound to be able to find creative solutions. We kept on going back to why. So why are we doing this? You, you know, we all agree that we want equity, we all agree that we want things to move forward in an equitable manner. Why? And when we moved that back and stopped doing the what and how, and started going back up to the why, and really trusting the staff, we found that we got a lot more done. If people kept on pushing back, the strategy that I was trying to deploy was to say, okay then, so how are you going to do this? You know, if, if we really wasn't going anywhere, and that, that's happened. I said, right, okay, well it's a problem, so how are you going to fix it? Uh, and then um, one of the things that Branca set up um, was regular feedback on performance. But one of the things I forgot to tell you is that we don't do the data collection we don't even run the data collection service. Uh, CAMH and the administration at CAMH run the data collection. They have a project officer who does not sit in health equity and that person runs the data collection. And their line management is nothing to do with he uh, health equity. We're the people who are standing by to help them, but this is very clearly an organisational priority it is run by the organisation. If the organisation, um, you know, if things start going wrong, they can't be trying to say this is a health equity issue. It's not. It's an organisational issue. So I'm going to finish now, and you're not going to get the last bit of data that uh, because it, which is a slightly different uh, piece of uh, work. Um, but as always, in, by the way, in psychiatry, you only survive by being optimistic. And I, I optimistically thought I could do more than I could, but I actually did uh, produce a break just to make sure that uh, I could leave you wanting more. Um, uh, what worked at CAMH? Health equity was positioned as an organisational need, not a health equity need. This was quality for the organisation. That's how it worked. We aligned health equity with a strategic direction. We've uh, aligned uh, the leadership around health equity, from health equity impact assessment training down through the organisation. We put the health equity office as advisory 
uh, but the responsibility lied with, lies with the clinical program. We tried to do some feel good factor um, work for the things that worked well, like the emergency department or, or so, to really uh, show that you can do it, it can happen, and it can produce results. And the end to the story, which is an agreement that we only got last week, was that the clinical leadership team has agreed that our target for data collection is 90%. So we're going for 90% minimum data collection for associated demographic data. And that by the autumn, each one of the three, uh, sorry, each one of the four uh, clinical program areas um, because CAMH is built into four clinical programs, I'm the medical director for one and there are three other medical directors. Everyone will have had their report, they've already got their health equity report from the data from 2012-2013, so they've got their disparities report, very similar to what we did in the UK. And um, there, as part of their strategic plan, they have to have an equity plan targeting at least one of the disparities and explaining how over the next two years they're going to close the gap. So that's where we've got to. These are some reflections about what we've done. It's not perfect, there have been bumps along the way, but I think we've, we've made a bit of progress. So thank you very much.